turn again in your Bibles to Revelation 19. On the outside of the outline, there is a diagram. This sort of focuses in on a major part that I have done before. And if you want to know the, uh, the additional part of this, what you're going to need to do is look back to an earlier diagram that you might have. But let me just point out to you some of the things so you'll understand what we're talking about tonight when we talk about two suppers. Right in the middle, the vertical line is a line that pictures the time when God's people will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 14 to 17 talk about that day. The trumpets will sound, the archangel will cry out, and uh, the dead in Christ will rise first out of the graves, and those who remain alive will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, their bodies will be changed, and they'll be caught up to meet the Lord. Now, before that happens, is going to be the Great Tribulation. I put here, the Great Tribulation Fulfilled. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 24 that immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will turn to blood, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and the angels will go forth to gather the elect from around the earth. That's what Matthew chapter 24 says. One of the main reasons why I say that tribulation is going to precede this being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. A number of other scriptures, we covered those before, we won't take time to do that tonight. But that great tribulation, I've called the wrath of Satan. It is pictured in the seven trumpets in Revelation, and it's covered in Revelation chapters 8 through 14. The Bible tells us that in this life, there will be tribulation for Christians. Jesus said that. But when we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, that's when the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to take place. We'll see that tonight in Revelation 19, verses 7 to 9. But down on earth, while we've been caught up to meet the Lord in the air for an undetermined amount of time, the Bible doesn't tell us how long that will be. But during that time is when the great Babylon will fall. We saw that in the past couple of weeks as we were looking at chapter 17 and 18 of Revelation. But it's that time that's called the wrath of God. It is the seven bowls of wrath found in Revelation chapters 15 and 16 in the fall of Babylon 17 and 18. That whole time is a description of the wrath of God and His utter devastation upon the earth and unbelievers. And that time is going to culminate in the great supper of God. That's the second supper. When, as you will see in Revelation 19, verses 17 to 21, all the nations will be gathered in God's presence. Jesus Christ will return according to Zechariah chapter 14, 1 to 5. We'll see this a little bit later this evening. He'll return with his saints, with his people, and he will destroy the nations. He will destroy the beast, the false prophet, and his followers. And it will be a great supper. The people won't be eating, but the vultures will be. Let us pray together. Father, as we approach your word in the book of Revelation, we ask, O oh God, that you would Help us to understand both the solemnness of your message and yet the joy and the hope that lies therein. I pray, God, that your spirit would be moving this evening in our hearts for those that are not headed for the marriage supper of the Lamb, that tonight your spirit would take hold of them and give them an invitation. Father, for those of us who are headed for that and maybe have lost loved ones, that tonight as we anticipate that supper, I pray that you would give us your hope. And Father, we pray now that you would speak to us from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Two months ago, Frank Theus and Julie Geis were married. Some of you were there. It was a beautiful wedding, right? But it also was a bit unusual as weddings go. The most unusual part of the wedding had to do with a rehearsal. Because at the rehearsal, Frank was not there. Frank was in Washington, D.C. He was taking his final exam for his new job that he was going to have in Washington with the State Department. And it happened to be on Friday, and he could not get a flight out soon enough to get him here for the rehearsal. So we had the rehearsal with everybody there except Frank. That did make it a bit unusual. Julie's sister, Jana Rowden, 
had never seen Frank. And so in the middle of the wedding, Janet said, right, Julie, you have this invisible fiance that is somehow going to appear tomorrow and is going to marry you. Right, Julie. Janet began to call him Julie's imaginary friend. And in fact, the question was even raised, is there really a friend? Well, we finished the rehearsal. and Later that evening, we went to the rehearsal dinner. Rehearsal dinners are something that Liz and I really enjoy to go to. It's a wonderful time. You get with an intimate part of the family, the closest to friends. The family is all there. It's a wonderful time of celebration. People who haven't seen each other in years are getting together and acquainting each other and talking and, and you get to meet new people. It is a wonderful time. But the focus in that rehearsal dinner is always the bride and groom. They're the ones that people will toast. They're the ones that have those special blessings that are given when a father or a mother or a, a best man or a friend will stand up and say some of the most precious and treasured things. In fact, there are things that are said that I, in my own heart, think it would have been great if those had been said over the years because you usually have to wait to get married to find out how much people appreciate you. But it's a wonderful time. But at that particular rehearsal dinner, the focus of her attention, Frank and Julie, they weren't there. Can you imagine a rehearsal dinner for a wedding and a bride and a groom weren't there? Well, Julie had gotten a call and said that Frank his test had finished early. He was able to get an earlier flight, so he was going to come at least in time for the rehearsal dinner. And so she went to the airport to get him. And we were there for a long time just talking with people. And finally, one of the dads said, well, let's go ahead and sit down and eat. I know they're coming sometime. And we all sat down and ate, and we talked. It was a grand time. Half hour went by, an hour went by, hour and a half went by. We're having a great time, but they're not there. And I'll never forget the moment when all of a sudden the double doors opened up and there were Frank and Julie. And at that particular moment, there were cheers of elation. There were sighs of relief. <laughs> and there was excited applause. It was a great celebration. There was even Janet. So there really is a Frank. And the moment I saw them, a tingle ran through my body. Because when I saw them, I thought I just had a glimpse of the excitement that there will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. When we, for the first time, see Jesus Christ, our Savior. Those whispering doubts of Satan in his cohorts that he raises from time to time, when he asks the question in our mind, is there really a Jesus? Do you really believe in this invisible friend you talk about? Do you really believe that this one called the bridegroom is going to come back for you? Those whispering doubts will disappear in a moment when we lay our eyes on Jesus, the bridegroom, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we will sit down at that great wedding feast and we will get reacquainted with those that we haven't seen in years because they have died and gone to heaven. Those who we long to see and right now even ache because they're gone. We are going to have times of meeting new people. You're going to have times at that feast to be able to meet Moses, David, and Peter. I'm scared to meet Peter for as many times I've preached on him. <laughs> it's going to be a time of meeting new people. But most important of all, at the head of that feast, is going to be the bridegroom, the one for whom we have lived. What a great day that is going to be. So we gather at the table around the wedding feast of the Lamb, best of all, being able to see Jesus face to face and to hear those voices say, there really is a Jesus. What a glorious day that's going to be. Well, the Bible tells us that those who are invited to that marriage supper of the Lamb are going to be a blessed people. Verse 9 puts it this way. The angel said to me, write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. They're going to be blessed. It is going to be the most exciting moment in your life beyond anything that you can ever, ever imagine. 
a blessed moment. Where is the wedding supper going to take place? Well, the banquet hall will be in heaven. If you look at chapter 19, verse 1, he says, After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of the great multitude in heaven shouting. With verse 1 of chapter 19, the scene changes. From chapter 15 through chapter 18, we've been down on earth. And on earth, we have seen the outpouring of God's wrath upon the nations, upon the peoples, those who have not believed, those who cursed God. His wrath is going to be poured out upon them. But now the scene changes to heaven. In verses 6 and 7, it says, I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting hallelujah for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. The wedding has come. It took place in heaven. That same phrase of great multitude is found in Revelation 7, 9. It even speaks there in Revelation about being like a sound of rushing waters. And this is what it says in Revelation 7, 9. There before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation and tribe and people and language under heaven, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. The banquet hall is going to be in heaven. But the betrothal, will be fulfilled at his return. For in verse 7 it says, Let us rejoice and be glad, give him the glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. The word betrothal is not something that we normally use anymore, but it is a word that means a promise in marriage. We usually think of it in terms of engagement. Sometimes in the Bible, particularly King James, it talks about being espoused. Remember it says that, Joseph was espoused to Mary. She, he was betrothed to Mary. And that is the time at which she was found to be with child. The Holy Spirit came upon her and conceived a baby in the virgin's womb. The betrothal is an engagement. And that engagement took place between Joseph and Mary before they were married. They were married at a later time. Those of you who are trusting in Jesus Christ, you right now are espoused to Jesus. You are betrothed to him. It is more permanent than an engagement. In those days, you remember that the Bible even says that when Joseph found out that Mary was with child, that he wanted to divorce her. I mean, it wasn't just give me my ring back. It was serious. And so what you have here in the picture is right now, those of you who are trusting in Jesus Christ have this betrothal. Let me read two scriptures for you. One is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Just to get a glimpse of this relationship right now that, that is taking place between the bridegroom and you, the bride, the church. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. This is the Apostle Paul speaking, but he is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it is God speaking to us through him. He says in verse 2, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I may present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. This is the engagement period. This is the betrothal. You have been pledged to Jesus Christ, and it is the desire of Paul. It's the desire of Christ. It's the desire of pastors. It's the desire of elders to present you to Christ in sincere and pure devotion to Him. You're betrothed. The wedding hasn't come yet. Another verse of Scripture is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, to show you the guarantee of that betrothal. It says in verse 13, that you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. The Holy Spirit is, the Bible says, a deposit 
The Greek word is the word arabon. It is, can be used in a couple of ways. One, it can be used as a little swatch of cloth that says this little piece of cloth tells me that back at the store, I got the whole roll. The Holy Spirit is a deposit that guarantees that the whole roll is still coming. Or another way of looking at that word deposit, it's like an engagement ring. It's like Jesus Christ has given us an engagement ring, a permanent engagement ring, giving us his Holy Spirit who dwells in us. He says, I give you this Holy Spirit to guarantee that I will come back for you. One day I'm going to take you to be my bride. The betrothal is going to be fulfilled when Jesus Christ returns in all of his glory. But thirdly, the bride's garments are the righteous acts of the saints. If you look back in chapter 19, he says in verse 7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. I've often wondered what would happen at a wedding if when those doors that are always closed back there, you know, the bridesmaids come in one at a time and the doors are closed because they don't want to let out the secret of what's behind there. I've often wondered what would happen if those doors would open up when it was bride's turn and she'd be standing there in blue jeans. Wouldn't that be great? Just to shock everybody. Never going to happen. No bride, no bride is going to come to a wedding except to be fully dressed. Jesus says the same thing is going to happen the wedding feast of the Lamb. The bride is going to make herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, were given to her to wear. And notice it says the fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Really two important things to understand here. Number one, with respect to understanding the righteous acts of the saints, is the bride was given them to wear. Verse 8 says that. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. The righteousness that we have is an alien righteousness. It is not our own righteousness, which we are going to one day stand before God and say, what a wonderful person I am. I know that you're so glad I'm here at the wedding feast. He gave us the fine linen. Romans chapter 3, verse 22 says, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It was Luther that called it an alien righteousness. It is not my own. Christ gave it to me. It's his. We are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, just as the priest could not enter the Holy of Holies without putting on the fine linen, white and clean. So that represented Christ's righteousness, which by faith is imputed to us. Another way of looking at this, as you think of uh, the acts of righteousness, you might say, well, it does talk about these being the righteous acts of the saints, and it sounds like we're doing something. I mean, this isn't just righteousness imputed. Well, look with me at Ephesians chapter 2. Because we need to recognize that even our good deeds are a gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. 8 and 9 are extremely familiar to most evangelical Christians. Verse 8 says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works, so no one can boast. It goes on to say in verse 10, because we're God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. He made us to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Even the good works that we do, even the righteous acts of the saints are things that God has prepared for us to do. We are only carrying out that which by His grace He's enabled us to do. So when you think of the fine linen, bright and clean, the righteous acts of the saints, remember, it is a gift of God. There's no way that we can boast, and we can never look at our fine linen and say, I have done this. God did it. It's by His grace. Does that mean I'm passive? Totally. Does that mean I go around this life and if I'm not, uh, you know, obedient to the scriptures, if I'm not seeking to 
uh, please Jesus Christ, I can go around and say, hey, not my fault. He didn't prepare them for me. You ever thought about that? Uh, the reason I don't pray is I don't feel the Spirit moving in me. So why should I pray? If God wants me to pray, He'll move the Spirit. That kind of abuse of the grace of God, where looking at it as having no human effort at all, is not supported by the Scriptures. Because you look back at verse 7, and the balance is this. The end of verse 7 says, For the wedding of the Lamb has come. You see what that is? And His bride has made herself ready what a balance it isn't just sitting back and saying well if i'm not doing these god it's your problem you haven't planned it but it is the bride getting ready for the groom and i know that brides take a long time for that to happen because when we meet at the rehearsal i ask the people when are you going to be there for the six o'clock wedding you know when it usually is about 11 in the morning. I mean, it takes a long time because they're not going to come here, not going to jump in that dress and get there. She makes herself ready. So too, God calls on us to do that. Notice First Peter, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. God does not call us to be passive in the process of sanctification. It is a work um, of God fully from beginning to end. It is by His grace. There's nothing good that we can do apart from His grace. But He does call on us to apply our effort to make ourselves ready. Notice 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. He says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And before I read the rest of this list, let me go back to show you what this very reason is. Back in verse 3, he said that his divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. In other words, God has given us everything we need. And because he's done that, therefore, he says, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's talking about this life. If you have these qualities in increasing effort, then you will be fruitful in your ministry for the Lord right now while you're alive. He goes on to say, but if anyone doesn't have them, he's nearsighted and blind. And he's forgotten he's been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. A rich welcome. Coming to the marriage feast of the Lamb, dressed in the fine white linen, not as 1 Corinthians chapter 3 describes as having the wood, hay, and stubble burned and we are saved as though just by fire. But being able to know that by God's grace, we have prepared ourselves for the day that we meet the Lord. The righteous acts stand, the fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saint. God calls on us to be ready. It's interesting if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. There's a great parable that sums up all these things. The banquet taking place in heaven, the betrothal being fulfilled at the at his return and the bride's garments being righteous acts of the saints. In Matthew 22, Jesus tells this parable. Jesus, who knew that he was going away for a time. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention. And they went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized the servants, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready. Those who are invited don't deserve to come. 
So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out in the streets and they gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled. Now, just before I read on, let me simply say what God is calling us to do. He talks about those who have been invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb or the ones who are blessed. He has given us the privilege to go out into the highways and the byways and the streets and to call people to be a part of that banquet. An exciting privilege that is. Wouldn't it be great to be a deliverer of such an invitation? God has raised up Twin Oaks with a real vision a group of people of a vision for reaching unchurched people, those who don't know the Savior. That is an exciting church. That is a unique church. But I want each one of us to take this to heart, to see the privilege that we have, because there are a lot of people, a lot of people out there who will respond to that invitation. But I want you to recognize that some who will respond will respond to the invitation, but they will not fully understand and though they may even appear to be Christians for a while, they really don't have the righteousness of Christ. Look with me as it goes on. Verse 11. When the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, how'd you get in here without wedding clothes? And he was speechless. King called the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. You sit here this evening. You alone know your relationship with Jesus Christ. You alone know if you've taken hold of that invitation. You alone know if Christ lives in you. You alone know if you've accepted by faith the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you've not, and if you're going to try to get into the wedding banquet with your own righteousness, you're going to be the person right here who is not fully dressed at the wedding banquet. I'm calling you tonight to put your faith in Jesus Christ. There is going to be the other supper. It's another supper that this young fellow right here is going to meet. Back in Revelation chapter 19, those that find themselves at this other supper called the Great Supper of God, they'll be cursed. And as much as joy floods my heart to speak of the marriage supper of the Lamb, sorrow floods my heart to speak of the Great Supper of God. It'll be a terrible day. The Bible tells us that this will be a day that the blood-stained rider will appear. In chapter 19, verses 11 to 16, there is a lot of imagery to picture Jesus Christ return to earth as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Do I believe that he's actually literally going literally to come on the back of a white horse? No. But all the imagery of the Bible does relate to something real that's going to happen. When Isaiah says in chapter 11 that Jesus, the Messiah, is going to come as a root out of the stump of Jesse, Jesus was not a stick. But it did refer to something real. and Jesus was born from the line of David. Jesus is not going to come on the back of a white horse, but he is going to come in power and splendor and majesty down from the skies as he comes to destroy the nations. Why does it talk about him having a robe dipped in blood? I'll tell you. If you look with me in Isaiah chapter 63, much of the mystery of Revelation is unfolded and clarified when you look at the Old Testament. Phil Long would be pleased to know that and hear that. He knows that, but you got to read the Old Testament to understand Revelation. Revelation chapter 63 tells us why Jesus, when he comes back, is going to be wearing a blood-drenched robe. Verse 1. Who is this coming from Edom, from Basra? Remember Basra in the Gulf War? Basra? Yeah, that was a city out there, one of the ones we bombed. Basra was near where Garden of Eden is. Basra means the grape gathering place. You'll understand why in a moment. Who is this coming from Edom, from Basra with his garments stained crimson? Who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I, 
speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. But why are your garments red like those of one treading the winepress? Because I've trodden the winepress alone. From the nations, no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger. I trod them down in my wrath and their blood spattered my garments and I stained all my clothing. For the day of vengeance was in my heart and the year of my redemption has come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. And so my own arm worked salvation for me and my own wrath sustained me. And I trampled the nations in my anger, in my wrath, I made them drunk and poured their blood on the ground. That's the day that Jesus Christ is coming back again as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he's going to destroy the nations, and it will be a bloody day. That's why his robe is splattered with blood. But also, this will be a day that the nations will battle to their death. Verse 19 says, then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. Verse 21, the rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of his mouth on the rider of the horse and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Verse 18 said that, so that you may eat the flesh. Well, in verse 17, it said, come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. It is that great supper of God that one day is going to be a supper for the vultures. He's told us that's coming. When Jesus comes to destroy the nations and there are thousands, millions of dead, there will be food for the birds. It's interesting when you look back at Matthew chapter 24, when you read Matthew chapter 24, there's a, a rather peculiar phrase that seems to stand out and seem a little bit bizarre. But it says in verse 26 in Matthew 24, when he describes the second coming of Jesus Christ, the distress that there will be, and the warning that they're going to be false prophets will appear. And when they say, I am the Christ, he said, don't worry about that. Don't listen. He says in verse 26, if anyone tells you there he is out in the desert, don't go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms. Don't believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and is visible even in the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, he's saying this. If someone tells you that Jesus Christ has come back again, don't believe it, because when he comes, you're going to know it. You will see it. Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus came back some 50 years ago. They predicted the day he would come back. And when that day came and went, they said, well, we were wrong. And they moved it up a little bit. And they said, when that day came and went, well, he did come. You just didn't see him. That's what they tell you. Jesus said, no, don't let anybody say that. You will see me. Just like lightning flashes from east to west, so the coming of the Son of Man be. And when he comes... How will you know it? Verse 28. Here's the weird verse. Wherever a car, there's a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Can you imagine the disciples when Jesus said that? I can see them listening to this whole story of Jesus telling about his coming, and he gives the climax, and where the carcasses are, there the vultures will gather. What? Well, many, many times Jesus gave these mysterious statements that were clarified by his apostles. And John clarifies what that is. And when Jesus Christ comes back again and every eye sees him, he's going to come and destroy the nations. And verse 21, the birds will gorge themselves on the flesh. That's the great supper of God. And then finally, it'll also be the day that the beast is thrown into the lake of fire. Verse 20, the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and, and worshipped his image. The two of them, that's the beast, second person of the evil triumvirate, and the prophet, the third person. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. If you look back at chapter 20, Look ahead to chapter 20, verse 10. Just a glimpse of what's coming next week. He says in verse 20, there's a 
there are three in the evil trinity. There is Satan, there is the beast who imitates the second person of the trinity, Christ, and there's the prophet. We see in chapter 19 that the beast and the prophet are cast into a lake of fire right then. Right at the great supper of God. But chapter 20, verse 10 says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. Satan is cast in there after the thousand years that we'll hear about next week. He is cast in, but the false prophet and the beast are already there. They've been cast in at the great supper of God. If the story ended there, it might not be quite as sorrowful. But it goes on to say in verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which was a book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that was in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The great supper of the God is going to be the culmination of his wrath. And those are the nations who do not believe in him, who do not trust in him, who do not commit their lives to him. They will not only be physically killed as a part of the great supper, but if they have not received that invitation, taken hold of that invitation, and their name's not written in the book of life, they'll be lost forever. Does that not give you a passion to tell people what Matthew 22 said, to go out in the streets and the highways and the byways, tell them to come. When Liz and I walked out of Frank and Julie's rehearsal dinner, we left a little bit early, not everybody was gone yet. We walked out into the hotel there and we walked down the hall and we stopped outside the door where another banquet was going on in a restaurant. And I looked into that dark room where people who were lonely were hoping to fill the loneliness with lust. People who were laughing, but they weren't laughing because of joy in their heart. They were laughing to just impress the other person, hoping to entice them. And I looked with sorrow, the emptiness and the loneliness in that supper. And I thought, what a contrast from what we just walked out in a joyous time of Christians at Frank and Julie's rehearsal dinner. What a glimpse of the wedding supper of the land. But we also got a taste that night of that great supper of God. Our hearts need to go out to those who know not the Savior. Fathers, we get caught up in the joy and the excitement of anticipation of seeing you face to face at the wedding supper of the Lamb. What a joyous celebration that will be. What a glorious day. I pray, Father, that you would also allow us not to forget that our work is not finished. There are others who right now are headed for a Christless eternity. I pray, O oh God, that you would not let us rest that you would not let us keep in a craven silence, but that we would speak, and be a part of your servants. We're inviting people to the wedding feast of the Lamb. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.